So thank you. You have all been sitting here so patiently. I'm going to be as provocative and as exciting as I can. I want this to be a discussion, not a speech. I'm going to challenge you. Feel free to raise your hand anytime. Let's have some fun. So first, I've spent 11 years of my life in government. I deeply appreciate what each and every one of you are doing. And for God's sake, if no one was bringing in the money, we would not be the world's sixth largest economy. So just God bless you for each, uh, what each and every one of you is doing. What I'm gonna do is give you a crash course on California, what has made us the global innovation leader, what is gonna happen next, what is literally the trends that are changing the global economy, and third, how it is going to change government, what you do every day. And after that, I'm gonna throw it open to questions. Anytime during this, you want to ask a question, challenge me, or just hurl some personal invectives, just raise your hand and I will we'll take it all on. But this is meant to be fun and as interactive as possible. First, how on earth did California get to be the uh, global leader? She was teasing me, I didn't have as many boards and commissions as Betty did. But when I was controller, we were the world's fifth largest economy now we're six. <laughs> Downhill. <laughs> this, folks, is it. And I just want you to know, I, I talk to a lot of people who say, I've been in California for a long time, you know, since 2000. I was born in California. I'm one of the rare people, 1956. <laughs> I've been around here for a while. I've lived in Silicon Valley almost the whole time. And I remember when I was a kid in Silicon Valley, it was Stanford, Hewlett Packard, fruit trees. That's it. We have seen the largest growth of an economic engine any time in human history. For our whole lives, I'm going to touch on this again. The 10 largest firms in the world were six oil companies, three car companies, and maybe U.S. Steel. Today, the 10 largest companies in the world are eight technology companies, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and there's still one oil company hanging on in the number 10 spot, Exxon. I don't see much of a future there. But just think about that, going from six oil companies and three car companies to eight tech companies. Most of them are headquartered right here in our state. This is the future of broad, broad growth. This is what we must maintain. What made it all possible? World-class universities, Stanford, Berkeley, Santa Clara, San Jose State. Risk capital, capital willing to go to work for people with big ideas, things that sound outlandish. I will tell you the Tesla story, I had a front row seat. Government funding, a lot of people poo-poo government funding. Folks, there is no internet without the United States Defense Department. There is no GPS without the United States Defense Department. There needs to be some level of commitment to R&D. And fourth, and I would argue far and away, the most important is this immigrant population we have throughout the United States, but primarily in California. This is what is driving Silicon Valley. Our ability to be a magnet for the best brightest minds on the planet that come here is what no one else can match. I had a picture here I was going to bring, and I had too many slides, but it shows a picture of eBay in the early days, and uh, the founder is holding an E, and Jeff Skoll is holding a B, and I'm holding a Y, and it's the quintessential American company. What is more American than a firm that gets its start selling baseball cards and Beanie Babies? You know? It's a huge story. And who founded the quintessential American company? The Muslim guy from Iran, the Jewish guy from Canada, best friends, uh, the woman CEO. That's California. That doesn't happen in other countries. That is why we are a unique planet. We have figured out how to make diversity work. And that is why California is still America's future. These are not my words. This is the cover of Time Magazine announcing it. So what I'm going to talk about are three things that are changing everything we do. There's this new mindset set forward by Steve Jobs. 
And the whole concept is if you don't cannibalize yourself, i.e. completely change the fundamental tenets of what you're doing and think up smarter ways to do it, someone else is going to do it for you. The American auto industry was asleep at the wheel and Tesla is disintermediating it, intermediating it now and I can give you a dozen other examples. That is the new ethos. That is what every millennial is thinking about doing. I'm here to tell you it's just as true in government as it is in the private sector. And you will see every facet of government starting to do things differently. Don't be the last to get to the innovation part. Second, in terms of what's new, we've got some new customers. For my entire life, looking backward, last 50 years, what you cared about are baby boomers because that was the biggest buying block in the world. And baby boomers, like me, dictated what the global economy looked like, dictated what global government looked like. And you know what this mindset is. It's who can buy the biggest TV? Who can buy the biggest car? Who can buy the biggest house? And then we're going to throw it out and buy a bigger one in about two years. It's done. There's a completely different mindset. And why do we care? We care for the simple reason that the largest buying cohort in the world, it has just changed this year, 2017 is where the split has occurred, largest buying cohort shifted from baby boomers to millennials for the first time. Gen Xers got left out, they're a smaller group, we're not as distinct. But millennials have the same buying game plan, thought process, values. What do they want? Number one, smaller carbon footprint in everything they do. Value added to base companies. Number two, complete connectivity with every part of their life, every minute. Their car, home, work, complete connectivity. And third, cleaner air, food, and water. This is the new ethos, and if that is what the new customer wants, you can bet that all of the biggest companies in the world are focusing in on that like a laser. Combine this new ethos of cannibalizing everything with this new customer base of people who have a different set of values or looking for a different set of products to buy and add in it the new technologies and business models. There are three of them that every one of you should know. This issue of the Internet of Things, the sharing economy, and big data. And I just want to say a word about each one because it will be affecting every part of your life from the tax situation you deal with to frankly how government is run. Pause here. 10 years ago, there were no smartphones. Two years ago, there were a billion smartphones in the world. Now there are already two billion smartphones. But that's just the tip of the iceberg because they're about to be, in the next two years, 50 billion devices with internet capacity. Every part of your life, from your car, my car already has it, to your home, to your clothes, maybe your children, if you get that chip in them to keep track of them, <laughs> will be internet enabled. And they just will. We kind of laugh now. Five or 10 years, you may not be laughing. I was talking about autonomous vehicles two years ago, and everybody thought I was crazy or nuts or both. Uh, no one thinks that's crazy anymore. If you spend any time in Silicon Valley, you'll see two or three of them pass you on the road. I was just talking with some friends of mine who just did their. Uh, 20 year um, uh, repeating their vows and they'd gone to Africa for their uh, honeymoon and they went back to uh, the Serengeti Plains where they have the Maasai warriors and you guys are all six foot four. And I said, how was it? And they said it was incredible. It was just as sort of powerful as it was when they got there and they still had these you know, warriors on the plains. She said the only thing that was a little different is they're all holding smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> they're poor, but they're all internet enabled, it is part of the new economy. Every home is soon to be connected. Every car is changing every aspect of your life. With it comes issues, security, public privacy. There's now, as you may know, a big murder case involving one of these three devices. I don't want to say which one, but in essence, uh, you've heard this story before, the wife has uh, murdered the husband, and it's all captured on this device where the wife says, that's it, I'm going to kill you, bang, bang, and now the question is, can your home 
uh, purchasing device testify against you in your own murder case. Uh, and that will be worked out. But these are all gritty, nitty gritty issues for public policy leaders. The Internet of Things, again, you would have laughed at me five years ago if I talked about this, but I just want to tell you this story. Uh, you know, I just did my 20th wedding anniversary. And if I told my wife, dear, I love you so much, we're going to go stay in somebody's back room in Rome, <laughs> she wouldn't be that excited. But for the rest of the world, it makes perfect sense. So let's just pause here. My entire life, as a baby boomer, if your parents had done kind of okay, they were part of the middle class like you were, and you go to on vacation, we used to go to Disneyland, and if you could stay in the Hilton Hotel, your parents had really made it big. It was a big deal. And why not? Hilton, in 2,300 cities around the world, it is a standard of American success and a huge brand name. But this thing called Airbnb that didn't exist 10 years ago, it's not in 2,300 cities, they're in 25,000 cities. And they don't have 700,000 rooms like Hilton. They're coming up on 1.5 million rooms and they're doubling every two years. You will see the sharing economy turning up in every sector, and I didn't include uh, the newest slide, but including energy because a lot of our major investors are utilities, and the big thing now is how you use this thing called blockchain. How many of you heard about blockchain? You're gonna be hearing a lot more. And it's talked about how you can make the transfer of currency frictionless, but it's not just currency. It's energy, too. And what the utilities are worried about is you will have what is called peer-to-peer -peer trading. So if I happen to put a ton of solar on my rooftop, I don't have a lot of trees, and I decide it's a lot easier for me to send solar to my neighbors, why not? And with blockchain, you can do that. This is part of the new economy we're all looking at. Big data is the third thing. There's more data, crunchable, available, and it will make us better decision makers for every part of our life. By the way, I see a bunch of you typing like crazy. Which reminds me of when I was in school. Keep typing. If any of you would like the presentation, I'll just send it to you. Because everything here is transparent. That is the new way. There are no secrets anymore. I know that's frightening to a few of the gentlemen in this middle row. No secrets <laughs> anymore. Anything you want, uh, let me know. You, you shall have. And you want your, your bank account? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you have more to worry about than I than I thought. Here. And uh, that's before marijuana was legalized. So uh, the whole punchline here is every industry is being disaggregated because of big data. And who is disaggregating transportation industry? It's Google. No one saw that coming. And the same thing, you know, did Visa ever worry about PayPal? Did Sony worry about Spotify? The whole point is, the world's changing quickly. You need to be part of it, or you are going to be either bypassed or run over. This is one of my favorite examples. Autonomous vehicles. They had a Ford. There's probably the laggard in the entire space. Just said, we will be putting autonomous vehicles on the road in 2020. They will be fully autonomous. And if you are thinking, my God, I'm, you know, I'm not sure my car is seeing this or that, I want to jump into the front and grab the steering wheel, you are out of luck because those cars will not have a steering wheel or gas pedals or brakes. Wow. And that's Ford. Other companies are putting these vehicles on the road sooner. If any of you have not driven a Tesla, I would just urge you to go to wherever the dealership is, go on a test drive. People have driven. Current Teslas on the road, not fancy things in the back of uh, some storefront uh, or you know in a uh, test facility. They've driven Teslas from Los Angeles to New York with hands off the wheel and accelerator for 96% of the trip. You can buy that car today. So these are not wild test vehicles. It's coming faster than you think. The only outstanding issues to be blunt 
are liability and insurance issues. We know this because the insurance companies are coming to us to invest in our fund for a simple reason. They've said for the last 100 years, we had a license to print money. We just had to wake up every morning and know that people were gonna hit other people in cars, occasionally someone's <laughs> apartment or home gets robbed, and occasionally one burns down. Pretty easy job. None of those things will be happening in the future. We need new business models. Almost every one of the major insurance companies in the world has opened a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley in the last 24 months because they have to change their business model entirely. You will see more of these than you know. I was just at a dinner with Eric Schmidt of Google and they said, Mr. Schmidt, how long do you think it will take before we see autonomous vehicles on the road, five years, 10 years, grandchildren, what do you think? And he said, next year. And it'll start in some easy cities, Singapore, Arizona here, Arizona, not a lot of hills, pretty straight, major arterials. And after they're there in any magnitude for a year or two, it'll begin to move out quickly. This will change a lot. By the way, amongst other things, it will drive the cost of transportation for transporting everything down dramatically. Number two, it will disintermediate a lot of people. Don't forget, being a driver of the largest occupation in the United States, about 3.6 million people. Time to think about retraining if you or a relative have a career there. There is an important role for government to get its arms around. So that's the overview. Let me bring it back to you. You're in the job of governing. You have arguably, I used to have the essentially same job you did for the state. I've got lots of entertaining stories about this. I, I'm sure this happens to you. Every time I'd get on a plane, I would sit next to someone and we talked about business and tech and eBay, and they'd say, boy, you wouldn't believe it. I got this place in Nevada. I don't play taxes anymore. I got the whole thing scammed. And I'd say, terrific, give me your card. Say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm the chief tax collector for the state. Bob, be in touch. Sure. These are the things that we want you to think about. And some of you may know I happen to be a Democrat. Uh, in fact, a serious Democrat. I used to be the vice chair of the Democratic Party. But one of the things I will tell you, the longer I was in government, the less I cared about party and partisanship because the answers on most every one of these issues are well known as best practices, have almost nothing to do with being a Democrat or Republican. And frankly, most of the elected people in Sacramento know the answers and know what the right thing to do is and they're not doing it for a host of other reasons. I will tell you basically what the best practices are, what our state ought to be doing in each one of these to make sure we continue to be the world's most productive economy. By the way, we're about to retake France, the world's fifth largest economy, and we have just a little over half the population of France. So think about that. The average Californian, for all of our shortcomings, are about twice as productive as people in one of the leading European nations in the world. That is a huge testament to us. In a nutshell, on jobs, we need tax reform. The things Betty talked about were exactly right. I will just throw this other thing out to you, which you probably do not expect to hear from me coming from eBay. Folks, we're moving to an innovation economy. More and more things are bought and sold over the internet than ever before. We, you, need to start taxing things sold over the internet the same way as in brick and mortar. Amazon, over half the households in the United States, and by the way, Europe, are now on Amazon Prime. That number is going up. Retail in this country, and malls in particular, uh, will collapse. It is all going online. If you are not taxing that, we will have a serious problem. My friends in Silicon Valley say, shh, don't tell them that. But that's the simple fact. We must get with the plan and focus on that issue. Education. We need a crash course in education. I will talk more about this later, but fundamentally, what made us great is our public education system in California and the rest of the country. We need a brand new curriculum to retrain people to be job worthy in the 21st century. Also, we need to deal with things like CEQA reform so we can begin to build in this state again. More specifically on education, if you look at the top 10 jobs in the United States today, 
Nine of them did not exist 10 years ago. It's things like social media, marketing, so on and so on. We have got to get a new curriculum for our young people that starts with programming in the first, second, and third grades. When I came through, programming was hard. It was appropriate for college students. It's been broken down. It's made easy. We need to get used to it. It is just like English or math. We need to be computer compatible and proficient to be successful in the new age. And we need to be doing um, retraining throughout life. We also need, and now that I'm not an office anymore, I can say it, <laughs> accountability in the teaching profession. We're sitting here with the world's fifth largest economy in our state alone, yet California, our state, the wealthiest state, pulls down test scores of the other 49 states. We're not less smart. We're spending more money. We're not spending it efficiently. efficiently. We need more accountability in public education. I went to public schools. My kids have gone to public schools. We need more accountability in education. I think all of you know this, and you should be standing up on issues like Vergara and others if you want to stay as a leader in the 21st century. Infrastructure, here's a broad picture to think about. When California had its period of largest growth, it was under Governor Brown Sr. 50 years ago. And the secret sauce, and again, this is the best practice, widely known, 25% of the state's budget, roughly speaking, went into infrastructure. It translated almost exactly to huge growth, about three or four percent on social services education. Today, about 25 percent on social services, and about three percent on welfare, on uh, infrastructure. There's a middle ground we are missing. If you talk to McKinsey or any other third party that tracks data, they will tell you the number one return on investment comes from infrastructure. Period. I would just like to take that a step further and say that the key infrastructure for the 21st century is no longer just roads, bridges, airports. That is all still important, but you've got to get your arms around these new things like universal bandwidth so that every kid, including the kids in Paradise in the north or uh, South Central in LA, we have got to make sure every person in our state has access to the internet. We need to be thinking about things like the Hyperloop and Autonomous vehicles will change everything. You've got to have this in your worldview. Housing, Betty talked about this at some length. I just wanted to highlight everything she said. I just want to add one piece as someone who's worked for a city. The incentive that says much of a city's revenue comes from how much retail you have in your city, which stimulates this arms race where everybody's trying to get the auto dealership or the Walmart 25 feet on their side of the city line is a pointless waste of time. We can do better. We need to change the incentives so cities have incentives to build affordable housing, put people closer to city cores. This is not a hard concept to do. I would ask all of you to be advocates on this. Let me just uh, stop here and then we'll throw it open to questions with two of my last uh, favorite slides. When I talk about some of these things, people say, how long is this stuff going to take to get here? I think my children might see it. And I just want to show you the slide on the left. What's interesting here, both slides are the same street, same day of the year, New York City, Fifth Avenue, Easter Day Parade. First slide, everybody's in a horse wagon. That's all there is. If you look very carefully, there's one poor guy in a little sort of putt putt car. And you know that everybody was thinking, no one's going to buy these things. It's crazy. Poor guys in this wild contraption, not happening. 13 years later, everybody, same street, same day, everybody is in a car, horses, buggies, like that has been passed by. If it happened in 13 years, 1900, how quickly do you think the move is going to come to this world of internet of things, autonomous vehicles, big data at your fingertips? I think faster than you might have expected. So let me close with this slide. In Spain, in the 14th century, 
On the bottom of every coin, it said, Me plus ultra. There is no more beyond. You sail out the Straits of Gibraltar. There's nothing out there, and you might just fall off and not come back. And that was what everybody was taught. No more beyond. We're Spain. We're the edge of the map, if you will. Something happened. Magellan, Vasco da Gama, Columbus, one after one, they go out, they come back, all saying, everything you have been taught and learned is false. There's a whole new world out there. And interestingly enough, the Spanish government began reprinting all of the coins to say, Plus Ultra. It's a whole new world, and I want to remind you of that instead. I'm here to invite you to be the explorers, the inventors in government, that are understanding these new themes, that are putting them to work in your cities and counties to better serve the public, to find new ways to cut costs, but still provide basic uh, liberties, uh, protections of your data, and so on. I'm asking you to be the creators of this new future because, mark my words, it's going to happen faster than you think. So thank you for letting me come today. So I would love to take any questions. All the rest of the time is open to you. And so industry stories, what it's like working with Arnold, uh, tax tips on eBay or Tesla, uh, I am fair game. Go ahead. Um, I love the crypto geeks and the Bitcoin uh, that's been built on the blockchain. Number one, um, you see Japan is embracing the Bitcoin and the U.S. We have the financial industry fighting it, and yep. getting their cut out of it. Do you see a shift where we might be able to adapt the efficiency with the Bitcoin uh, blockchain technology? And then second, do you know any local governments or states that have actually um, really used the uh, efficiency Well, I was hoping for some tougher questions, but let's, <laughs> let's just start with this one. So first, folks, Bitcoin is coming faster than you know. It's coming faster than you know because the transfer of money and currencies has been impeded for ages by governments. There's different uh, currencies, there is transaction rates, and it takes a long time. When I was a kid, you used to have money wired through American Express. It's all going away. The cost is going to be shrunk, and it's going to happen quickly. Point two, and this is just an anomaly. What really has held up Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies is the people who developed the first one were completely clandestine, not transparent. And one thing you should learn of anything is in the new world, the world of the internet, right, everything is transparent. And it scares people when stuff is not public. The first thing we did on eBay, because you have to enable a seamless amount of trade, we said, one, anybody who ever trades on eBay has to say who they are, and it has to really be you. And second, you got to give us a credit card so we know that it's true. Overnight, all the graft and corruption went to the other sites, because no one forced people out in the open. You must do that. This is why Bitcoin is faltered. There are other firms. The one I would bet on personally is something called Ripple. It is out of San Francisco, and what makes them special is they invite in the FBI, the SEC, and every other federal agency, and everything they do is regulated and monitored. So you want the benefits of the technology, but having an open platform that is verifiable at the same time. But it is coming. I don't know if Ripple has a division that serves, say, local governments, but it's just a matter of time that you might start by checking with, uh, with them. Other uh, questions? Have some fun here. I want this to be interactive. Sir. Uh, where in government, in California, local, state, where, what areas are the most innovative? Where do you see, like, I mean, are, the tax, are we going to lead the charge, or is it going to be our IT departments, or any, is there anywhere in government where is innovation happening? So I am here for two reasons. One, I want you to lead the charge. I want to implore you to lead the charge. One thing that I'm proud of that we did when I was controller, I had Betty's job uh, before uh, she did, is he got me in all sorts of hot water. 
But like most things that get you in trouble, they're the things you are proudest of. We said, number one, we should make it easier to file your taxes. When I was younger, I was always driving around at 10.30 at night when taxes were due and the library was closed and I couldn't get the darn forms and didn't have what I needed. And we said, we're gonna make it online. And it was just a slam, a slam dunk, straightforward thing. Second, we said, frankly, for about two thirds of the public in California, we could fill out their taxes for them because they have a W-2 and that's it. And we literally uh, came out with an e-tax program where we sent the taxes out uh, pre-filled. Said, if you'd like to redo all your taxes, go ahead, we welcome you. And this is just for people standard W-2, which is most folks, not big deductions and so on. Um, and you will get your returns. About two thirds of the people are owed returns uh, within a week. Otherwise, you can wait two and a half months. It saved us money because lots of people make errors. It was all done. It streamlined things. People got their money back quicker. It was a win-win-win. Things like this should be done in the future. I think, as a lot of you know, when I was controller, we anticipated that as much as 15% of the taxes currently owed and on the books, maybe 20, were not paid. If you're in Greece, it might be 40%. But if we could collect those taxes, it would have a dramatic impact on our schools and our pension funds and other things that are at risk. So I would urge a lot of you to think about database matching and using some of these technologies to make sure not that we raise taxes, but that we better collect the taxes on the books. But there are a number of things you could do here. Any of you are looking for sort of an interesting tutorial of what is the broader range of can be done, Google or Wikipedia the country of Estonia, an online government. There is a person I actually was with him two weeks ago. He was at Stanford. In fact, he is sitting at Stanford today, the Uber Institute, who basically said, I've got a somewhat backward uh, country in the Baltics. It had been Soviet run until uh, the independence in 89. And because we don't have a lot of leg legacy systems, in fact, we have damn near nothing, a lot of shoeboxes practically, we're going to put our entire government online all processes starting like in 30 days. He did it, you should take a look at what he's done. It's probably the most stunning example I've seen in government. But you can look at best practices. The other entity I would make a beeline toward if I were you is McKenzie. There is no greater repository of best practices and government services than McKenzie. Um, I'm not suggesting you hire them for consulting, they cost an arm and a leg. But in terms of understanding the basics, what can be done, what to look at, go to your McKenzie office, they will help you. Other um, other questions? Yes? Who was, the, uh, who was the state treasurer when you were state controller? Ah, uh, the state treasurer was uh, Mr. Angelides. And uh, some of you may recall we ended up running against each other for uh, governor. And uh, forgive me, I have to tell this story. Uh, he won by four points. And the bad news is I was ahead of Schwarzenegger in the polls, and he went on and lost to Mr. Schwarzenegger by 17 points. And the reason I draw this out um, it's not that he's better, I'm better, it's that we now have an open primary. And what would happen in the old world is the person who was furthest to the left would win the Democratic side and furthest to the right would win the Republican side. And then you get two people who are like way far apart and a lot of people would say the voters don't have a choice. Today we have an open primary. If I'd run back then, uh, it would have uh, given me a huge edge. And I would just suggest to all of you now that decline the state or no party preference has passed the Republican Party as the second biggest party in the state, those people aren't even allowed to, would not be allowed to vote without the open primary. And so we are just, uh, we actually are allowing everybody to vote. I would submit that's a good thing. But in a country where more and more people are saying, I've given up on both parties, I think there is a great uh, argument to uh, consider the top two. The other thing, just as the state's chief financial officer, when we didn't have the open primary, there was such partisanship. You kind of can picture this, you know, the people from Berkeley would send the most left-wing person you've ever seen. People from Orange County would send a right-wing fire breather, and legislature can pass anything. But more to the point, from my standpoint, we could never get a budget done on time. And that cost the California hundreds of millions. I'd have to go back to Wall Street. It was a mess. Today, with everything in the legislature, by God, they're passing a budget, they're getting more legislation done, seeing more moderates. I used to joke, I used to be the patron saint of the moderate caucus in Sacramento. It was terrific. There were five of us. Today there's 32 and it's growing. And I would submit when you need a state to move quickly, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, who cares? 
move quickly to keep up in this extraordinarily rapidly moving global economy. Uh, you want a group of people who are getting along, willing to make compromises to be able to stay moving forward. Other uh, other questions? A woman here, and then we'll come to you. Please. Um, with technology sort of being the big wave, you know, and cars and everything, and kids driven by technology, they can't even form a proper sentence unless it's like through texting. Um, and fighting the dark net and Russia and Equifax and all of that, where's the how do you stop this perfect storm? I mean, what's education doing to, to get our future generations to protect us given we're relying totally on technology? God. So that is my favorite question of, of the day, maybe of the year. So the question is with all these new technologies, the dark internet and Russia uh, trying to uh, fiddle with our elections and kids addicted to online how do we deal with this? What, what school do we help us out? That is the question of the day. That is what we should have been discussing in the last election instead of building walls at the border and how many Muslims and Latinos we're gonna deport. That is the issue of the day that no one is talking about. The best single article I've seen on this is in the Atlantic Monthly uh, two months ago. If anybody wants it, give me your card and I will send it to you. I've got two kids in high school and I will tell you and our kids are fine and squared away and aren't using drugs. But they are so addicted to online games, it is astonishing. We need to give some real thought to that. Side by side with it is who the heck are they playing with? What are the privacy issues? I mean, we're not even thinking about the privacy issues for us, much less our kids. That is a big issue. That is what the legislature should be focusing on. It breaks my heart. Forgive me here for being partisan for a minute here the ridiculous things our president is talking about when we should be talking about preparing our kids to get jobs in the future and preparing our younger kids from a life free of addiction, whether it's opioids or uh, internet gaming, and to make sure that they are safe from predators. And there's smart things that you do on that if you want to listen to this article. Um, this woman, right here. I just have a simple question. I want to know the hyperloop is, and I know the gentleman in the third row don't know either. <laughs> No clue. no clue. So, okay, I'm going to share with you a, a couple of Tesla stories. Um, let me just start with Tesla for a minute because some of these ideas, not all of them, were made broadly popular by this guy named Elon Musk. And whatever you think of this guy, and I can tell you stories because I was an early board member at Tesla, he stood up when we were there, and there were, when we invested, there were 29 people in a warehouse in San Carlos, California. And Elon said, we are going to remake the global auto industry. And at the time, the only electric vehicles anybody knew about were like the uh, you know, golf carts, and they, they were in the bicycle lane, and you just you know, kind of felt sorry. Uh, <laughs> Tesla has, in fact, remade the entire global auto industry out of a warehouse in San Carlos, California. Tesla has a larger market cap than Ford or General Motors today, and soon larger than any other auto company in the world. People say, that's crazy, they don't sell that many cars. Well, this year they're doing about 11 billion in revenue, next year 20 billion in revenue. It's a real company. The reason they're valued so highly is because they're growing 50%, and everybody else is growing 3%. And they're not just cars anymore, they're solar panels, and they also have power storage. And the big issue here, just take a deep breath and think about this, we're creating a world right here in California where you will never pay a penny for gas or electricity ever again. That's a big idea. I have to think Tesla is a bargain, given what they are doing. And I say this partly because our venture fund is funded by the world's larger utilities, and they're all scared to death trying to figure out how they deal with that issue. So Mr. Musk comes out about three or four years ago, not his idea, but there is a concept. Uh, you may have seen in the old movies where they have these tubes and they put notes in and it would kind of get sucked off to a different department in the building. It was common in New York where you go up and down the line. Hyperloop is basically putting a small train on some sort of largely frictionless path, not necessarily a vacuum tube, to but part, possibly something like a maglev type train, but in an air uh, 
in a tube so there's not air friction or friction beneath. And you can shoot people very large distances um, without using much energy at all. You need to be careful about the stopping part. Um, <laughs> not completely a joke, but if you're going four or five hundred miles an hour, you got to make sure things are not in the way, which is why it's an enclosed tube. But you know, there's some physics there. Most people, including me, thought, well, that's lovely on paper, but A, how many years is it going to take before this happens? And B, I sure don't want to be in one of the first ones. <laughs> they now have at least two or three companies with Hyperloop technology doing one, two, and three mile um, test runs now. I have not personally seen one with my own eyes, but I've talked to people who have, and they have said, A, this is all happening sooner than you think. B, it will reduce costs a lot. The reason I mention this to you is we're looking at one of the biggest investments the state of California can make when we have huge interest rate and public pension funds that are 35% underfunded today that could easily be dropping to 60% underfunded if there's any recession whatsoever and we're looking at spending $100 billion on high-speed rail. If you could do something like a Hyperloop at a third or a quarter of the cost, wouldn't that be a good idea? And the answer is yes. So before we embark on building this 20-year, $100 billion facility, I'm just suggesting you all should begin asking the questions about what we should be building for the future. The same thing goes for the Thomas vehicles. It's going to change buses, public transportation everywhere. And again, it will drop the cost down a lot. I've got another about five minutes. We can take two, three more questions. I just hope this is fun. She's first. You're second, and do we have a third going once? You, you've got it. You three, and then we'll fight. suppose they can use some of the high-speed rail lines now to put the Hyperloop air bubble on? <laughs> <laughs> so no. It's <laughs> challenging. <laughs> there's two issues here. There's where the heck you route the thing, and that's laden with politics. You all know that. And, you know, we let the plan on your side of that. The rub here is what they're building now is on a certain type of track, and what you need with the Hyperloop track is different. On the current track we have now, the train entity will sit on it. A Hyperloop is key. It is uh, essentially suspended in the air. Uh, this is not a new concept. The whole thing with transportation is less weight is better, and what you're shooting for is zero friction. The real aha in the Hyperloop is zero friction, so it is a different thing you need when, when you're building. It's kind of like saying, you know what? There isn't that much traffic on the train tracks. I'll just drive my car out there. Uh, you got to match the transportation to the, the tracks, and that's the run. But if you see articles about the Hyperloop, read it. It's the future, and it will change a lot. For the younger folks here, you will see this in your lifetime. You'll be thinking, my crazy parents, they just wanted to see those trains because they, they just like those old trains. And they were probably sad when they stopped shoveling coal. Um, gentlemen here. You talked about the disruption of the technologies in energy, and transportation, communications. What do you see coming for the real estate industry, if anything? Wow. So, real estate, we work a lot with the real estate industry. We, we focus on three areas, energy, transportation, and smart buildings. What's so interesting is for the last 50 years, these were completely disparate. Utilities didn't care about talking to the auto industry. The auto people didn't talk about you know, home building. Now they're all integrally connected. So in terms of the real estate part, land is land and it's kind of a great asset and the toys can have a certain amount of value. What's interesting to me are the buildings. And in very simple terms, buildings are going from dumb buildings that really hadn't changed in 100 years to smart, digitized buildings. We control every aspect, heat lighting and so on, from your smartphone. That is what's going on and that's what is amazing. Just a couple things. Energy costs will go down a lot. Employee comfort goes up a lot because for the first time you have control. And the third thing that is uh, so interesting to me is that lighting will become the intelligence of building. We have an LED lighting company and it has transformed from lighting to a lighting <coughs> sensor software company. So let me just stop and explain this. Your lights in the future, like these, if they were smart, would not only dim and go down based on 
whether it's lunchtime or whether it's night, and how far they are from the window. It would have occupancy sensors, so when you left, it would know to go on and off. That's easy. But it would also have full Wi-Fi, so all of you have had instant Wi-Fi in every part of the building. It would also track inventory. If it's in retail, it would give you automatic coupon discounts. So when you walk by the sports section, it says golf balls on sale, and it knows what you like. <laughs> Brother gentleman at the marijuana shop. <laughs> so the point is, all of these things are changing uh, quickly, but real estate's in an area where there's a lot of attention now because it's one of the last places to really uh, change. So stay tuned, it's fascinating. Um, yes, sir. Uh, regarding Tesla, how long do you think it would be uh, sustainable without having a profit? I know you talked about the revenue side, but is it um, just as important as like, earning like, some money? <laughs> So the question is, how long can this crazy thing Tesla go without earning uh, uh, money? And the short answer is, as long as they can raise additional capital, they'll be fine. But a full stop. I served on the board of Tesla. I chaired the audit committee. People said, oh, that crappy company is just losing money. Tesla makes more money on every car it ships out the door than any other automaker in the world. God bless Californians for a bright law. The reason is Elon is taking every dollar he makes and pumping it into his efforts with solar at uh, Solar City and with his efforts to make lithium ion batteries more cheaply than anybody else on the planet. And the only reason Tesla's not making money now is they're plowing all this money into building something called the Gigafactory. Full stop. This will be the largest building in North America. You all know how big a Costco is? It's roughly 100,000 feet. You've been in one, they're enormous. This building is a little bigger than 100 Costcos. Oh, wow. This building's a mile and a half long. It will be the largest producer of lithium ion batteries in the world. Most of my life, the cost per kilowatt hour of energy is over $2,000. About five years ago, for the first time ever, it went below $1,000. That's when electric cars started to make sense. Today, below $200. This is why the, uh, internal combustion vehicles cannot compete. I know this is kind of a bold thing to say, but who cares what I think? The head of General Motors said last Tuesday, General Motors is going all electric. I've been saying this for five years. People say, they're not gonna do that. Are you kidding me? All these plants, and they build internal combustion engines. Don't take my word for it, head of General Motors.